Thank you. I'm really glad to be here today, and I'm uh, very happy to be invited to talk to you all. Um, I have uh, worked at other universities uh, around the country. I began at Southern Illinois University in Carbondale. I went to the University of Southern Mississippi in Hattiesburg, and then on to the University of San Francisco, and now here at Berkeley. So that's kind of given me a, a view of the different cultures that can exist at different universities. So. Um, those folks who are possibly new to Berkeley, as I am, uh, are probably aware that this institution does things in as, uh, its own special way, <laughs> as most institutions do. And so what I was hoping to do today is kind of give you an overview of how things are working at Berkeley and give you a chance to ask questions. Uh, just before I begin, though, how, could I find out who, what faculty we have here? Uh, is anybody faculty? Okay, great. I'm glad you've come out. Covering um, many departments within the college. So, material. Andy Miner from Material Sciences. Great, great. Okay. And I'm Sanjay Kumar from BioE. Welcome, welcome. Uh, I'm very proud of you for coming because this is the type of thing that most faculty, uh, you know, don't really want to think about. But I think it's very wise to do so because it can solve a lot of your problems going forward. And I understand this is being videotaped and hopefully other faculty who don't have complex can see it later on. Uh, and And I believe there are follow-up sessions going to be uh, given by the uh, Assistant Vice Chancellor, Pat Schlesinger, and Jill Baldwin from my office that will be coming up. So keep, uh, keep your eyes open for those sessions coming up. Now, sponsor projects, as we're, I'm at the sponsor projects office. I put our website there so that you can see where we are located. Uh, that would take you to our main web page, and I'm highlighting it here because this website has so much information. It is a treasure trove of information about the university, information about contracts and grants, uh, questions that people have asked over the years. Uh, we've provided guidance. Now, because it is so extensive, it sometimes is difficult to find the information that you're looking for. Uh, it will, we are planning a redesign of the website uh, this coming year, but uh, one thing that I've learned how to do is at the very bottom, if you look uh, at the very bottom here, there's a search the SPO website button. I use this all the time. If I can't find something, I just go in there and plug, plug the keyword in and then, uh, you know, usually I can find several things that will get me to the right place. So I encourage you to use this as a resource. You'll find um, on this a direct link to um, UC Berkeley Forms. Uh, which if you're looking for something that you have to fill out for a particular purpose, fund advance, proposal review form, whatever, you could go directly to that. Uh, some of our um, information about policy is also uh, linked at the top, uh, funding opportunities as well. Um, not too many people know that we, ha we subscribe to uh, two search engines, funding search engines. One is called the Community of Science, COS, and the other is called IRIS, which I believe stands for Illinois Researcher Information Service. But both of those search engines are for Berkeley people to use. It's a fairly intuitive uh, system where you go in and use keywords to uh, identify the things you're looking for. Now, it is not a perfect si situation because what you'll find is when you enter a keyword, it will bring you a universe of opportunities. And the job is to, is to narrow those things down to the things that you really are interested. But it's a good way to get a, ver a good first cut uh, at the things that you are uh, wanting to find out about. And these systems give you a, a very short and sweet abstract so you have a better idea of whether or not this is something you would like to pursue in the future. The IRIS system has a mechanism where you can ask for alerts to be emailed to you uh, on specific topics. And in other words, if something were to come up on a particular area, 
the IRIS system on a weekly basis would send you an email to, to alert you to go to your, uh, to a, go to a website where you will then be given that listing. So it kind of keeps you up to date with the kinds of things that are out there. The COS system uh, does not have that alert system, but it does have a, an ability to save a search parameter, which then you can then go in and if you're interested what's what's been happening in this particular area, you click on that search and it will again bring you up everything that's uh, new and uh, timely in that particular area. So I encourage you to kind of take a look at that. Um, okay, I was sent a number of questions, so I thought I would just <laughs> get right into it because um, uh, you might as well, you know, <clears throat> excuse me, I apologize to the video on my throat's a little bit uh, uh, impaired by a cold, but I'll do my best. <clears throat> Question, how should the indirect cost rate be handled for research-related IUTs between Berkeley and LBNL from now through March 31st? Well, what we discovered in implementing uh, this particular uh, uh, policy uh, is that uh, we are still kind of in an in-between area. Um, the VCR has indicated that he would like a pause to occur right now until the end of March. The reason for this is the memorandum of understanding between Berkeley and LBNL is being redesigned and, and will be signed shortly. But some of the details of that have not yet quite been nailed down. Uh, we had hoped to roll out something so it would coincide with the start of the new fiscal year for, for the feds, which would be October 1, but unfortunately it, the process is still going on and so we really can't, uh, really can't say definitely how this will be handled. Uh, so what we do know is until the end of March, any IUT, inter, uh, inter Inter-university transit, yes. Uh, any IUT will not have any FNA on it, just as it, they never have had, okay? So until March 31st, there will be no FNA charged. All right, FNA stands for Facilities and Administration Costs. It's, it's a new way of saying indirect costs, overhead, uh, NICRA, there's lots of different names for it, and, and I, I, I'll be happy to answer questions about it, but it is the rate that the university charges on all of its uh, sponsored projects when it is an allowable cost. And um, right now, the way the IUTs are handled mm -hmm. is th that LBNL pays for direct costs, and indirect costs are, are paid at the end of the year in sort of a lump sum fashion rather than on each individual project. That is where we are right now and it has not changed uh, until March 31. Uh, SPO will continue to process all IUTs as of right now. There has been discussion of possibly uh, dividing up I IUTs into different categories. Some of them would be research. Okay. Inter-university transaction, transfer, transfer, IUT. So what that means is that LBNL gives money to the university for a variety of purposes. Now, one of the confusions has been, in the PI's mind, naturally, what they're doing is research, okay? Uh, some of these IUTs, though, might be defined as research, but more specifically, recharge services that the university is providing, in which case it is not exactly research. So what we discovered in talking with LBNL is we use different vocabulary, and that caused a lot of confusion. So what we are doing right now is just saying all IUTs, we don't care what it's for, go through SPO right now. Later on, there might be a division where some of the things that are very specifically research projects will go through SPO and things that are not recharge thing, uh, kinds of, of activities, um, maybe uh, shared personnel kinds of activities will not go through SPO, but that has not been determined yet. So we are really where we always have been. Nothing has changed. Um, and everything goes until March 
31st. Okay, now at the end of March, we hope to have guidance that we will then be able to provide to the campus that is more clear about how to deal with this. And that guidance will come from the VCR's office. Uh, so I will just say stay tuned, uh, proceed as normal as of right now. If you happen to have turned in an IUT that has indirect costs on it, uh, what we're doing now is turning it back to you and asking you to redo it without the indirect cost. Okay. What is the Federal Funding and Accountability Transparency Act, FAFADA, as it is known, and how does this new reporting requirement impact campus departments and or faculty? Okay, there are two ways that, uh, well actually three, that the university tends to get money from the federal government. Uh, one is in the form of contracts, and the other is in the form of grants or cooperative and cooperative agreements. Now, the difference between a cooperative agreement and a grant is that in a cooperative agreement situation, the, the funding agency views itself as a partner. They, they kind of help you design your project and they help you envision how it's going to be carried out. So there, it's not like they, they say, here's the money, you do what you want to, make, uh, to, to achieve your goals. <coughs> Under a cooperative agreement, the, the agency actually is involved in that discussion. Um, now, grants and cooperative agreements tend to be handled in a similar manner, though, in terms of administration, whereas contracts have a few more uh, bells and whistles attached to them. Now, this Transparency Act treats them differently. Um, for contracts, for example, from October 2010, to February 2011, this FAFADA requirement is going to apply to any prime contract that we receive that's $550,000 or more. But beginning March 1, any prime award that we receive that's $25,000 or more will be subject to FAFADA. For grants and cooperative agreements beginning October 1, 2010, any award that we receive of $25,000 or more will be subject to the Transparency Act requirements, which I'll get to in a minute. Now, this means that if the initial award is below $25,000, but then over time it begins to, through supplements, receive more than $25,000, the minute it's, it gets to that $25,000 threshold, the FAFADA requirements kick in. So, what does this mean? Everybody's looking like, ah. <laughs> the primary impact is that recipients of new federal grant awards with an award date after 10-1 and any resulting first tier, sub only first tier right this minute, are going are, are to really feel it first. What is first tier? That means the university gets money from a funding agency and then the, uh, the university gives it to a sub-awardee. A second tier would be if, if that subawardee then gave money to another group. So it's, that would be a second tier, lower tier. So if, for example, uh, I'm just trying to figure out, <clears throat> uh, let's say um, UCSF gets a grant and I'm getting a subaward from UCSF to do some work. Is that a second tier? Well, that's kind of a, an, an example that's a little funny because, see, UCSF is actually the same institution. Uh, yes, yes. If you use Stanford, Stanford gets the money, Stanford gives it to us, we are first tier. No, no, no. <laughs> no, only the, only the agency receiving the funds is, is a tier. Individuals, it doesn't apply to. Okay. Um, it does not include, this is what it does not include, any projects that are continuing or renewals of grants awarded prior in prior fiscal years. So anything before October 1 is not going to be affected for grants and cooperative agreements. Contracts are affected, but the, the, it's, it's really something that would only affect the very largest kinds of contracts that we get. And here's the other thing. If it's money coming from the ERA or the uh, the Recovery Act, the Re American Recovery and Reinvestment Act monies that we've been receiving 
from the federal government. If that's the source of funds, FAFATA does not apply. So just kind of remove that. Um, all this has to be submitted through the FAFATA, oops, through the FAFATA reporting system. Now here's the good news for you guys. You will not be required to report it. SPO is going to have to report it. Okay. Unlike ERA, where you really had to be very much involved because it was expenditures of funds that you had to report, this is not quite the same thing. What we have to report is the minute we obligate money to a subawardee. And that will occur when our subaward team in SPO signs the document. And that's when the clock begins to tick. So by, let's say, uh, if, if we sign something this month, we would need to report on it by the end of next month, okay? Now, these are the kinds of data elements we're going to have to report. Now, so I guess what I'm trying to say to you guys is you don't have to worry about it too much because it's not going to be on your plate to deal with. However, one thing I have highlighted in red is that we are going to be required to report the total compensation of the most highly compensated executives uh, of, the sub, of the first tier subawardee. I'm sorry? Well, yes, employees of the, of the agency. So for example, I guess if you were working with a regular university, not something as complex as this, but you'd have to report uh, whoever makes the most money at that institution. Uh, that would be the football coach, the basketball coach, and you know, those types of folks, but you'd have to report it. However, they, there is a loophole. It, it, there are certain things that, that tie into this that you would not end up having to report it if, for example, you know, that information is already publicly available, which for most public institutions of higher ed it is. I highlight it, though, because sometimes you have subawards with for-profit groups. And for-profit groups are not always fond of reporting information about themselves in this very public manner. So that could potentially be a bit of an issue going forward. Uh, and we'll just have to see how that plays out. Right. We would, if the, and here's the criteria, if they re receive 80% of their funds from federal sources and funds all their funds oh. and at least $25 million from federal sources and none of this information is available publicly already. And, and so that really, really narrows it down to um, really small group of, uh, of I, th I think, of subawardees. So um, it is, but it is, it is a requirement, just so you'll be aware of it. The other thing is that <clears throat> all of our subawardees now are going to have to be registered in the Central Contractor Registry, the CCR, and they're all going to have to have a DUNS number. Now this is stuff you faculty just don't worry about it, Be because it's, it's just going to have, to have to occur before any subaward is made. Now, it will have an effect on you if you're trying to get a subaward established and the subawardee hasn't done these things. That will slow things down. But it's really a more of an administrative process. So FAFATA, SPO responsibility for reporting, and we're still working out how that's going to be done, just being aware that it might be another layer of, act, of information that a subordinate will have to provide us, which could have a bit of an impact on how quickly the subawards are established. <clears throat> okay, here is a number one question. Why does SPO require proposals to be submitted five working days before the proposal deadline? Okay, first, it's not a SPO policy. It's a vice chancellor for research policy. It was established in 2008 by Beth Burnside, and it was modified by the current Vice Chancellor for Research in 2009. And the thing that you should be aware of is these modifications were in response to faculty input about 
how this could be better handled. Okay, so what we have now is that it is possible to turn in your proposal with a draft technical section by the, do, by the five working day deadline and still be considered on time. Okay, that would then allow faculty to continue to refine and improve their technical section, which it admittedly is the most important part of the proposal, uh, until it's ready to be submitted. Now, what we try to do, though, is to get that technical section turned in on time as well, because as, as I will describe in a few minutes, we are dealing with a transmission of proposal issue. Uh, if it was the matter of, you know, when I first started in this business, all you had to do was, well, not all you had to do, but it was quite, a, it, it was uh, a little less complicated. You duplicated the proposal, usually 30 copies of something, and then you took it to the mail, you, know, you took it to the post office and they stamped it postmarked. That was the end of it. That was, that was your, that was all you did. Now with the electronic transmission portal grants.gov, which is where most federal agencies are using it, uh, Fastlane for NSF and grants.gov for mostly everybody else. These groups have a system where they check the proposal as it goes through the system. And if there's anything wrong with it, it gets kicked back. Whereas the postman never gave it back if you missed, if you missed a piece of paper or missed a signature, this thing will now send it back. So that is part of the reality of our lives now. So we try to get that draft technical section submitted so the proposal will actually get to the agency on time. Another uh, uh, modification of the policy was the late proposal approval process. We now have a system where it, and we recognize that at times it is impossible to get something in by the five day uh, deadline. So what we are now allowing faculty to do is to submit a request for a late proposal exception, explaining what, what, what happened, why you need it, and then uh, the vice chancellor will approve or disapprove that particular request. Uh, the truth of it is that the vice chancellor uh, likes to try to approve these because we want, you know, our goal is to get all good proposals submitted. Um, Again, we do try to ask people when they have these late proposals submitted that they work with our research analysts to make sure that the research analyst gets it in time to get it into the system to submit it. Our warning is late proposals are at risk. They're, they're, it's just the reality of the situation. A late proposal story. Okay. Proposal received at SPO as a late proposal three days before the, a major agency deadline. And you have to realize that, I brought this date along, in FY 2010, we had, we had 3,387 proposals submitted. That's, and we have uh, 10 analysts that submit proposals. So all of these people submitted a lot of proposals. And so they're not just dealing with one proposal you know, a day. They might have 20. And when they have a major deadline come through, they might have 40. So making sure that all 40 of these guys get into the system in the best shape possible and make it all the way to the agency is a very big uh, goal of ours. And so a major deadline is even more of a, of a hot time than any other. Um, the proposal was then reviewed by SPO two days ahead of time. And so what is SPO looking at? Well, we're looking for things that would be violations of university policy, things that might be violation of the agency policy, things that might actually keep the proposal from making it through the system. Um, now, the reality is, and my experience has been, a PI and, and their departmental person, if they have been working really closely with a proposal, very intently, sometimes small errors do get overlooked. And those are the very things that can cause difficulties. So, uh, and sometimes these errors are big, big errors, and so that, that could cause difficulties. The other day we had somebody who had actually attached, 
remember I told you about this draft model? Um, they had attached their draft thinking they had attached their final. And so they had sent it in, oh, this is ready to go. And so the SPO persons caught it and said, okay, this is not the right, not, not the right thing. Um, okay, so then after we identify a problem, we ask the PI department administrator to correct the problem. The PI returned the corrected proposal to SPO on the deadline date. Okay? SPO submitted the proposal through grants.gov three hours before the deadline. One would think that would be plenty of time to handle it, right? An error message was received from grants.gov eight hours later. Okay? That means that it's after the deadline, 5 p.m. Uh, our time. Okay? Submission failure. Okay? Reason? We are missing an email address for a contact person. That's it. So these minor little glitches can actually stop an entire proposal from being submitted to the agency. So when we put forth this, you know, we like these days ahead of time, it's not because we just want to make our lives easier. I, you know, what we're really trying to do is to make sure we don't fail you. Because if we can't get it into the system, we view that as our failure. Uh, and we, we don't want that to happen to anybody. So that is why we are trying to encourage folks to, to think about the, the lead time and, and make sure that you appreciate the, the, what really is happening in terms of the submission process. Now, I don't know if anybody here is doing NIH kinds of activities, but NIH has been giving us a little bit of a, of a, a pass here. They've been giving us a two-day correction window. That ends January 25th. There will be no error correction window. So, yeah. So anything that goes in that used to be able to be corrected after the fact now won't be. It will be one of these submission failures. Why are they changing Well, they thought that they would allow this to, to um, sort of be phased in because they thought that PIs needed a chance to kind of move away from the paper version to the electronic version. So they gave everybody two, two days to, to and they, now they said, I, they figure everybody should have learned this by now. Uh, now the problem is, I have to say for NIH, they, they have a pretty high bar. Uh, many of the agencies are not quite as picky as they are about everything. So um, they do, they are going to be asking a lot of us. We're going to have to be very, very careful about the things that we're submitting. Can I ask uh, just a, a question like this? So I, I have an MSF report that was on there. So I sent it to this from uh, last month. Yeah. And um, the uh, contact is still always asked, and I, but I have the technical draft. Mm -hmm. And the contact is still asked me to uh, make sure everything's there by tomorrow, Thursday. Mm -hmm. Mm-hmm. Of course, I would love the weekend. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. that's, that's, that's huge, right? So, uh, so how much you know, flexibility is there? So obviously, it's my own risk. Mm -hmm. It's submitted on Monday morning. You know, I, say, I go into NSF last night and say, it's okay to submit on Sunday night. And you send it on Monday morning. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, if, if yeah, I, th I think the thing to be aware of is that if your proposal was all that was going through the, right now, that would probably be easy enough to take care of. The problem is that you're in a queue uh, with lots of other people, some of whom have no problems, some of whom have lots of problems. And so that one person will be working on all of these simultaneously. And when they get to you, uh, will be when they can. So it, it is a bit of a risk if you, if you submit it uh, later because it could end up with um, some kind of thing that, that has an error that we just didn't have a chance to look at, didn't have a chance to find or see. So, I mean, ideally everybody would love to have right up to the moment, you know, and... 
Well, what happens is the our, our sponsored projects office is authorized or delegated to put the institutional signature on the proposal. So it's being signed on behalf of the institution. Because, I mean, contractually what's happening is the money is not really going to you. It's going to the University of California. And so when the money comes in, it has to be signed by a representative, authorized representative. Well, yeah, because um, although it might sound, you know, odd, but some people don't actually, uh, you know, have the, all the details in their, in their technical, you know, non-final draft. And so sometimes we have to make sure that it is what we're actually submitting is what we think we're submitting. And so that, that's part of our job, to make sure that, for example, nobody is promising something that we can't deliver. Uh, or we don't, we're not promising something that somebody else can't deliver. Uh, for example, we might say, well, we're, we're collaborating with this very special group, and they're going to provide all this stuff to support the project, and, uh, and, but nobody's even contacted them yet. That sounds absurd, but it does happen. And so now we're submitting a proposal saying, we're going to have all this stuff if you fund us, and we don't have it. And that's actually fraud, so you know, we don't want to do that. So, you know, our job is to make sure that what we submit is what we think we're submitting, and it's in accordance with uh, the university's policies. So, okay, so, in my personal experience, I, I had this happen to me. I, I, uh, for a research proposal, I had um, I promised that some of the work would be done at Lawrence Berkeley National Lab because I would collaborate with people there, and they made me take that out because the, the university can't guarantee that, you know, we could use that for the project. So, that's just an example of kinds of things to look for. Right. So, Right, and it might be all we need is a, a letter, you know, stating, you know, that that's that's going to happen. Um, so, in the previous uh, month meeting, uh, one of the um, new faculty did ask, well, why can't I just, why do we need to go this through school, and why can't I submit the proposal directly? But I think the answer is because the university has some kind of authorized. authorized it's delegation of authority. But, also, but with Fastlane, I I believe the faculty actually can upload different parts of the proposal. That Fastlane is the ex uh, exception. Grants.gov won't allow you to do that. But I think with Fastlane, you actually yeah. can yeah. update. In the end, it's all that's for the press Right. So I think. Well, it's actually uh, it's not yeah. all. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so on our, <laughs> on our side of Fastlane, you know, like you see your side of Fastlane. On our side of Fastlane, what we're seeing is what you're uploading and putting into the system. And then Fastlane uh, gives us a, uh, a check. We can check to see what kinds of things are there, what, what's missing, in a very general way, okay? Uh, but then it's also looking through the different components to make sure that everything is in compliance with what Fastlane asks for and also what the university requires. So they're doing all of that review and before they push that button, they, they, when they push that button, they're really saying this is being authorized by the university for submission. So it really is a, a, the, the official submission process. And, um, Well, yeah, but then they, you know, this is one of the interesting things because when we were talking to faculty, they said, well, I'm only going to change the technical section. But what you discover is sometimes when you're writing the technical ch section, it changes the budget, mm -hmm. it changes this, it changes that. So it's a little bit, uh, you know, uh, squishy uh, in terms of that. And uh, so we, what we're trying to do is to say, yes, go ahead and work on that technical section, but we really would like to see it to make sure it's conforming with everything else that's in, 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 the, in the project. And, and that's hard to do. As you, as you know, writing something, you know, you're, if you're changing the last minute, you're going to go, oh, my gosh, so now I've got to do this, now I've got to change that, oh, I've got to take him out, I've got to put her in. So there's a lot of things that can get changed at the last minute. Uh, so we, we really are trying to give you enough time to do what you need to do, but also asking for you to give us enough time to do what we need to do to make sure that it, it doesn't get messed up uh, 
in the review process or in the submission process. Um, okay. All right, how does the subcontracting process work at Berkeley, and why does it take so long after the primary award has been made? Okay, so there, it is a long process because you, what you're doing is you're submitting a proposal, and ideally you have identified a sub-awardee that you want to work with. Now, if you put that, into, if that, that group's name into the proposal, that speeds things along because in most cases, not all, but in most cases, if the agency approves the proposal and it's got the subawardee's name there, that means they're approving that relationship. Some agencies require you to go back and get special approval, but most don't. So we ask you to put the name of the subawardee in there. Now, there's a new form that has been uh, implemented recently. It's called the subrecipient subrecipient commitment form. And we, what we ask you to do is to get your potential subrecipient to fill out that form at the proposal stage. And the reason we did that is because it often takes a while to get this information. If we, if we, and if we're actually going to make an award, we're going to take longer if this information isn't there. So we're asking you to provide us that information at the proposal stage so that we can be ready when the award comes in. And that came out of a business process analysis that we went through to try to make things more streamlined. We also have something on that uh, subrecipient commitment form that asks the subrecipient, are you really a subawardee or a subcontractor, or are you a vendor? Are you a supplier? And the reason that's important is that a subaward should really only go to a true partner, not some group that is just providing a service that they provide to everybody. It should be going to a true partner that engages in uh, program decision making, not just somebody you say, I'd like you to make that for me just like this, and I'll pay you this much for it. Now, the reason people like to put things into the, into the subaward category, even if they're not, is because on a sub-award, the indirect cost is only charged on the first $25,000. But when you're using a supplier, the indirect cost is charged on all of the costs for the supplier. So you can sort of see why people might want to lean in that direction. The problem comes that when it comes to us and it turns out to, we, th we thought it was a, uh, a sheep and it turns out to be a rabbit, we don't handle rabbits, we only handle sheep. So it sits there until we can figure out where it should really go. So that is one of the reasons it kind of gets a little bogged down because people are putting things in the wrong categories. Um, so here are the typical subcontracting barriers. All right, we are dealing with a lot more subagreements than we used to. Why? Because many of the agencies that we're working with are asking for partnerships. They're asking for collaborative research. And you can only do that if you go out and get partners to work with you. Uh, we, you know, it used to be there was only a few sub-awards here and there. Now it's a huge thing. Now in response, what SPO has done is we've, we've hired a uh, one new FTE to work with our, on our sub-award team and we are doing a search for a second one. So we'll end up with three people working on sub-awards shortly, which should shorten the, uh, the time that it takes us to handle these things. But you have to realize that it is a process, uh, and I was kind of getting to that. After, it's, after you've submitted the proposal, the award comes in, we now look at it, we ask that subordinate to tell us if there's anything different from what they provided on the subrecipient commitment form. There is a subagreement written up by our staff, and what we have to do is we have to flow down, what's called flow down, every element in the prime award to the sub-award. We have to tell them that they can't use this money any differently than we use the money. And so we provide that document to them, we send it to them, and then they have to do something with it. They have to review it and sign it, and that takes a while. Then it comes back to us, and the minute we sign off on it, then, then it becomes an active uh, uh, sub-award. But sometimes that can take a while because people are looking at the terms and conditions and they're saying, I don't think we want to do that. And so it can be problematic. Um, 
Now here's one that it could easily be solved. Many PIs are not aware that they have to request that a subaward be issued. They think, I submitted a proposal, it had the subaward in it, the thing was awarded, where's my subaward? The problem with that is that we have to ask you to tell us you'd like us to issue that subaward because you could have changed your mind. Just because it was in the proposal doesn't mean necessarily you really want to use that group. You might want to use a different group, or you might want to pay the group less than you had planned. So lots of things can happen between the proposal and the award stage. So we ask you to please make the request, and there's an official way to do that um, if you check our web page. There's also a lot of complexity in subawards these days. We have a lot of things going to foreign groups. We have more subawards going to for-profit groups. Now, sometimes the for-profit group really is a partner. And we have to, if we've determined, yes, they really are a partner, not a supplier, not a vendor, then we have to work with the way they are. Their a university and a for-profit group have very different rules and regulations in the way they do things. So we have to make a sub-recipient uh, agreement that matches who we're dealing with. Um, there often are conflict of interest issues. In, in this particular college, we have a lot of people who are doing terrific things, and they're out there, and they actually have established companies, and they want to have agreements with the companies they've established. But there is a conflict of interest if you are giving money to the company that you own, uh, uh, have, have uh, a business interest into. So we have to deal with that. Uh, we can have inexperienced subrecipients, groups, uh, a lot of foreign groups that we work with. They, you know, we say we'd like you to fill out this mini audit questionnaire for us so we can know how you, how you handle your funds. And, you know, they don't even know what to make of this thing. They don't know how to, how to fill it out because they don't do any of the things that we ask. But our problem is we can't give the money to them unless we're sure that they can handle it. Um, and often that, that those, these types of groups don't have enough working capital. Money comes to us usually from the federal government in the form of what they call cost reimbursement. We spend the university's money and then the federal agency reimburses us for what we spent. Now when we have a typical subaward to let's say Stanford, we say the same thing. You spend your money and then we'll reimburse you for what you spent. But you've got, you've got a little XYZ group in Africa they don't have any money to spend, so we have to give them money up front. And that's a little bit different and causes a little more time till we figure out how that's going to happen. Um, I already mentioned vendors being treated as subrecipients is a problem. And transactions going to the wrong office as a result. So I just want to kind of go over about what we do and what we don't do and the other offices on campus that you should know about. Sponsored projects mentioned. Link to funding search engines. We review proposals and we approve and submit them. We negotiate contracts and awards and uh, we uh, transmit this information to the extramural funds accounting group, group on campus, EFA, because they're the ones who actually establish a fund number for a project. Uh, we establish sub-agreements. We process fund advances. This is when you need your money now, and the award has not yet been finalized. And I'll talk about this in a minute. We process no-cost extensions. This is, you have money left, but, and you still have work to do, but you ran out of time. We have a way of helping you with that. We process bud budget modifications. This would be for an agency that doesn't allow you to move money around very easily. You actually have to get permission to do so. And we manage uh, f uh, freedom of information Act requests, FOIA requests, and you might find us contacting you because some other uh, PI at another institution would like to look at your proposal. They're, they're interested in, in what you're doing. And that is a request that we will get from the funding agency at times, and we will contact you and ask you, is there anything in this proposal we don't want to show them? Okay. Um, what we don't do, be aware, when we're checking budgets, we are not adding up your columns, we are not checking your rates. The one thing we are doing is looking at whether or not the F&A rate has been handled correctly. But it's important for you to know that whatever budget you submit, if you, if you 
gave the wrong salary and the person gets less money than they should have gotten, that's not something we're going to be checking. We're only looking at the F&A or the indirect cost. Um, and we're also looking to see if there are allowable costs on there. Is what the university negotiates indirect costs with the Department of Health and Human Services, DHHS, and they do this on a periodic basis. Um, right now we're in what they call a base year, where they're, what happens is they look at the amount of space the university allocates to research and the amount of space they allocate to instruction, and they look at the administrative costs associated with both types of activities. It's a very complicated um, formula, uh, uh, logarithm, that I've tried very hard not to learn because I never want to have to do it. But we have a group on campus that is involved in doing that, and they come up with a rate. Can, can, can faculty negotiate with the university on uh, indirect costs? No. <laughs> uh, for indirect costs. <laughs> Right. Uh, for let's say 25, you know, pay, but then within the direct cost, it's just really not worth going through. Um, and, you know, maybe it's not a big deal for senior faculty, but, you know, yeah. Industry, starting, All right, let me. Okay, well, let me tell you how it works. Okay, first, you, you have to remember that Berkeley is part of the UC system, so we can never forget that uh, the University of California policy on indirect costs is what we are required to deal with. Okay, so what our policy is, is that we charge our negotiated rate except when the agency has a standard policy of paying less indirect costs, a standard written policy. And the way we're allowed to use that policy is that the University of California President's Office has a database of every agency that pays a lesser rate. And we have, it's called, um, you know, the F&A waiver database. And so we're able to actually go in and look to see if the university has approved us accepting that lower rate in the past. And if we have, then the research administrator in our office can say, okay, this, is, this has been approved previously, and so we can go ahead and use that rate without any question. We just have to let UCOP know that that's what we are doing. Now, if it's not in there, and it's not an agency that has a, um, well, yeah, that, that would be difficult for us to do, and I'll explain about companies in a second. Uh, with, with a small grant, under $100,000, there is something called the uh, vital interest waiver that can be issued by the vice chancellor's office depending upon whether or not it's conceived as a vital interest to the campus. And um, there are a number of criteria that are looked at. Uh, one could be that it is seed money for something that is going to be happening. Uh, they could grow into something more in the future. But that is something that, and I want you to understand that SPO is facilitating the, the discussion about this, but SPO itself is not making that determination. We are asking either the President's office or our Vice Chancellor's <coughs> office to make those decisions and then we follow what they say. We try to help you present what you're doing to them though so that we can move it forward. Now with industry, and I'll mention this in a minute, our office does not work on projects to industry. That is a different office. That's the Industry Alliance Office, okay? And so they would work with you on how, how you're going to handle that, okay? Okay, sure. Uh, and I mentioned about F&A waivers, late proposals. We, uh, we do not set up project accounts, all right? We do not... Um, approve late proposals. That's done by the Vice Chancellor for Research. Uh, we don't manage project accounts or, or subrecipients. We don't write or submit project reports. We don't process invoices or any other fin financial transaction. We don't decide who submits limited submissions. That's done through the Vice Chancellor's office. We merely submit them. Okay. Business services 
has two parts. First one is business contracts, BCO. Now this is supposed to be for non-research contracts. They have something called consulting agreements, all right, which is a, a little bit of a difference in terminology. Most people think of consulting as, uh, you know, I'm going to consult with this person on their project. But consulting in this term means providing uh, advice to the campus about the management of the campus. So it's got a very different kind of meaning here. They also process fee for service agreements for use of the university's, out, uh, university's you, quote, unique facilities. And this is in response to the university policy of not competing with private vendors. So it's not supposed to be anything that is already out there. We also have procurement services. Now, here they've got independent contractor agreements. This would be for processing consulting, for consultants on grants. That would be an independent contractor agreement. Now, we do have an insurance requirement that's built into that that sometimes makes it a little difficult for people to, to do this, but it is a university requirement, so it is what it is. Uh, they also uh, process uh, other technical specialized professional services. Uh, and they handle the supplier diversity program. Now, the main thing to know about this is right now SPO is working with BCO and procurement services and EFA and campus legal counsel to see if we can come up with a better description about what each of these offices does. We recognize that it is not clear at this point in all cases who should handle what, and that often leaves the PI and the departmental support team you know, in a quandary as what to do. So that is going on right now, and we're really hopeful that uh, by the end of this, we will be able to give some more clear guidance about this. Um, as I was mentioning, Industry Alliance's office handles corporate sponsored research agreements, intellectual property issue, and material transfer agreements. One of the things I noticed when I got here is that SPO was really sort of the group everybody thought did everything. And although we have our fingers in lots of pies, we actually don't do every single thing on campus. So uh, we, the important thing here is to work with the correct office. You'll, you'll find yourself moving forward a lot more, more quickly. Um, industry funding, they, they handle contracts, they handle gifts, and they handle grants from industry groups. So this is the group to work with if you're involved in that sector. Extramural funds accounting. They are, they are the people that, once they get the news from SPO that this award has been finalized, it is good to go, we put it into the COEA system, overnight it is transferred to EFA, then they set up the fund uh, uh, for this particular project. They are in charge of financial reporting. Uh, they are in charge of reporting on cost sharing. They are in charge of error reporting. Uh, they are in charge of effort reporting, invoicing, external financial audits. I tried to get them to say they'd be in charge of FAFADA, but that didn't work either. <laughs> they said, nope, sorry, that's yours. So we are, they are not in charge of FAFADA or Transparency Act, but they are still doing a tremendous job pulling things together for ERA. So improving our efficiency. And it's, the, the thing is, if we work together more closely and more efficiently, then everybody benefits. Uh, and here are the proposal speed bumps that sometimes causes difficulty. And I'm putting this out there because I know faculty might be seeing this on video. These are the kinds of things that if you would like stuff to move forward more quickly through SPO, pay attention to these particular things because this is what we see holding things up. Incomplete proposal routing forms. The form is there, uh, and, it, and each part of it is a very specific, serves a very specific need. If you leave part of it unfilled, it will probably come back to you, or somebody else will try to fill it out, and that will take more time to accomplish. PI exceptions. In order to submit a proposal from Berkeley, you have to have a certain qualifying title. If you don't have that qualifying title, you need to have approval. Now what SPO does is we look for something from the dean's office saying that we have applied for this qualifying title for this particular person. We don't necessarily require to have the approval in hand, 
when we submit the proposal, but we do want to see that the dean has at least requested it. We look at cost sharing very, very carefully. This means you know, the, the type that's mandatory, of course we accept that as, as part of the proposal process. But we often get voluntary cost share, stuff that is not really needed. People just put it in to sweeten the pot, thinking this is going to be helpful to their case later on. Uh, that is really the old days. The new world is nobody wants to see cost sharing. Why? Because if it's there, we have to track it, and the federal funding agency has to track it, and they don't have the personnel or the time to do that. So do not put it in there, and if you feel it is necessary to explain that you have all of this support for your project, go ahead and say that, but just don't quantify it. Because the minute you put down so-and-so is going to put 10% of their time to this project, it becomes a cost share item that must be tracked. Uh, however, if you say Dr. Smith is going to devote sufficient time to this project to ensure all goals and objectives, all goals and objectives and activities are are accomplished, that's fine because nobody can say this has been quantified. If you look at the SPO webpage on cost sharing, we provide numerous examples on how to express that there is support for the project without quantifying it. Administrative costs. We are all suffering because there isn't enough money to, to pay for the administrative support needed for sponsored projects. It starts from the very beginning with the fact that the federal government caps the part of the indirect cost rate that's used for administration at 26%. Most universities, including this one, are paying way more in administrative costs to, to support sponsored projects. Um, so people are doing things like putting in a secretary or putting in something that's truly an administrative cost, not a programmatic cost. And when those things are in there, they are not allowable because we are charging already for those costs in our indirect cost rate. So when we see those in there, that's going to slow things down. Non-Berkeley personnel. Now, non-Berkeley people can be in there as independent contractors, but they can't be named as part of the Berkeley proposal in a, in, a, in a specific role within the project because there's this thing called affirmative action and we, are, we, we can't hire somebody before we actually have the project. So uh, what we ask people to do is to, to not name them but to indicate that uh, one workaround is to say someone with these qualifications will be hired. So then that way we, you can show that you have the kind of people that would, would be needed to do the project without specifically putting in their name. F&A errors. And again, SPO, SPO research analysts are monitoring that to make sure that that doesn't happen. But if you have any question, please contact them about it. Missing proposal elements, uh, things that are just left out. Uh, you know, they, for, they forgot to put in a particular... Um, requirement of the proposal, or maybe they, again, it might be something as simple as not putting in a collaborator's letter. Uh, inadequate PI involvement. We, we live in a vast world with lots of people able to move all over the place and interact electronically, and that is a reality, but we must make sure that the PI has uh, direct uh, oversight of, of his or her own project, uh, allowing somebody else to manage it manage it often leads to problems down the way and it is within the CNG operating uh, guidance, uh, contracting grants, mm -hmm. operating guidance that the PI is, plays a very central role and is responsible for his sponsored project so you can't leave it to somebody else to do. Again we've talked about the problem with late proposals, missing commitment letters, missing signatures. Uh, that's a big problem. And so we, we are looking for signatures indicating that the proper approvals have been obtained so that the proposal has uh, our approval to go forward. You know, if, if, if somebody's put down space needs and someone within their college has not approved that, we certainly don't want to submit anything like that. Financial conflicts of interest have to be handled. Um, and if you have a for-profit subrecipient, 
that's going to be a little bit more of a, of a bump because you're going to end up with having to make sure that that subrecipient clearly describes what their true role is on this project. Award negotiation challenges. Everybody wonders why does it take a long time to get awards negotiated? Well, it's because it isn't a handshake anymore. You can't just say, I'll do this and you do that and we'll shake hands and that's all you need. It's a truly legally binding document that we're working on and we have to make sure that we protect the PI as well as the institution. So these are the kinds of things that will slow stuff down. Less funding that's awarded than was anticipated. If you agree to, if you put in a proposal for a million dollars and they end up cutting that in half, it is not likely you'll be able to do the same scope of work. So something will have to give here. Um, also, payment in another nation's currency can be problematic. We, we try to get it in U.S. dollars, solves problems later on, and if the, um, if the conversion rate tips in the wrong direction uh, and causes the project to lose support. Uh, sponsored terms and conditions could be difficult for Berkeley to accept, and here are some walkaways that we, we, we see all the time. If they say this is going to be classified or restricted, that can be problematic for the university because the university bases its um, um, export control um, policy on the fact that the university does not accept these kinds of restrictions. In other words, we have an open environment where it is possible for people to, um, to share information widely. So this will always be something that will slow things down. Publication restrictions. Uh, it is our job as a university to publish and share information to improve inf knowledge and information uh, in a particular uh, content area. Um, um, PI might say, well, I don't plan to publish. But it's one of the realities of research. It's, a, it's an open-ended uh, uh, activity. One does not know what is going to necessarily happen at the end of a research project. There may be, in fact, something that you want to, to share. And if you've already agreed not to do that, then that really will negatively affect the PI. But it also, again, puts the university's uh, export control policy in, in jeopardy because we are, we are not, we're not making things available to a general audience. Um, things with drug testing of Berkeley employees or students is a, is a walk away. Uh, something where the sponsor says, I need to own all of the intellectual property. And the PI might say, well, I'm not going to have any. But I have seen it happen where they started out not happen, having any and then ended up having something that belonged to somebody else by that time. So the university does not agree to that. Third party indemnification. That's a problem. Unacceptable insurance requirements. Export control issues that cannot be managed. That we try hard to make, make, find a way through that, but there might be something that's just impossible for us to do. Um, by by third-party indemnification, I'm, I refer to uh, the university accepting responsibility for something that somebody, some other party does that could end up, uh, you know, causing uh, uh, the university uh, to pay. Uh, penalties of some sort, uh, and it's, a, it's against university policy for us to accept that. Um, you, the president's office will work closely on, on that with us if a particular agency has, uh, you know, is, is very firm about this and will find, hopefully find a way through it. Uh, and unfavorable payment terms is another one that can cause problems. So SPO offers a number of ways that we can help you with some of your issues. I mentioned fund advances. This is a way of getting funding earlier uh, so that you can begin your project before the actual paperwork and administrative things have been finalized. Um, we do not want to have people putting costs for one project on another project, especially another federal project, because this can really uh, put the, the university in jeopardy for many fines and penalties. Uh, no cost extensions I mentioned, go through SPO. We like you to do that through us because that way we can make sure that we know that you're trying to do it and we can tell EFA, extramural funds accounting, not to close out your account. If you're doing it all by yourself and nobody knows about it, 
it could end up with the account being closed and budget modifications. Now here is an example of our, or the sort of the heart of the fund advance uh, form. We have three ways you can get a fund advance. The first way is if you've got a federal award and it's under what we call federal demonstration partnership or uh, RT uh, research terms and conditions uh, standards, then we can award funds up to 90 calendar days before the actual start date of the project. SPO will look and find at the award document and, and, and determine whether or not this is possible and we can handle it ourselves at SPO for, for the type A. For type B, this would be something that does, we can't handle it through type A and so this one we're asking that the principal investigator sign and offer a fund number that can be used as a backup for um, their particular um, fund advance. Now some groups on campus, this is all that's required, others require that it be co-signed by uh, the administrative unit as well and you'll have to check with your administrative unit about how that is done. Uh, and the third one is you, you can't make A, B, so you, now you, you have option C, and that would be really up to your administrative unit if they're willing to say, okay, we will, we will sign off, and should anything not go as planned, then the, university, uh, the, the unit will be responsible for any deficit that results. Um, so we try to give you three options, and within those options, uh, find a way to really uh, help in getting funds out there earlier uh, so faculty can use them. So, a few updates. I mentioned NSF after January 18th, 2011. A data management plan will be required on all NSF proposals. It will be in the guidelines. I encourage you to look at it carefully because if you don't have one, it will not be accepted. Voluntary cost sharing will be prohibited. This is NSF's words, prohibited. So be very careful that you're not putting that in after January 18th. For NIH, after January 25th, we mentioned the error correction window will go away and they will limit uh, resubmissions, uh, the period between the first submission and a resubmission to 37 months. It cannot be any longer than that. Uh, their, their reasoning is that if something's later than 37 months, it's probably not um, current information anyway. Uh, mentioned uh, NIH is having some regional seminars in March, March 28th and 29th, close to us in Phoenix. These are excellent uh, seminars if, for new faculty who have never participated in anything like this. They bring program officers there. They give you lots of guidance about proposal writing. Um, it's an excellent opportunity. Another one is planned in June in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. Um, NSF just completed one. Uh, their regional events are also quite good, and I'd recommend any new faculty member who has never attended uh, either NIH or NIS NSF to, to take advantage of that if you can. And you can find this by looking at their, their web page. So that it concludes what I had brought to you today. Uh, I don't know if anybody in the group has any questions. Great. Okay, Great thank you.